thank you everyone for coming here, not to my lecture, but to my home, which is the California Academy of Sciences, which also now hosts a nice uh, exhibition of human evolution just behind you. So if you do not have the opportunity to see this new human odyssey exhibition, I encourage you to have a look at. Um, I would like to uh, thank the Licky Foundation for sponsoring and for uh, inviting us tonight to give a talk uh, on diet, which I assume concerns every single, single person in the room today. Uh, diet is uh, today one of our, uh, in spite of the calories, obviously, it's one of our key uh, characteristics as, as a species that uh, distinguishes us from many other species. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the staff of the California Academy of Science, including Gary, for uh, doing such a fantastic job at every stage of this organization, of this series lecture. So, thanks to the California Academy of Science and the Leakey Foundation, and obviously thank you for coming. I would also like to welcome my colleague, uh, Christina Warner, who will be talking more about what you eat whereas I will be talking more about what you ate. <laughs> Not yesterday. <laughs> so, if you told me what you had was only one or two minutes, I would tell you the following things. One, you can use carbon-stable isotopes to e explore diet today and in the past in millions of years. The carbon isotope the stable carbon isotope. Second, apes have C3-based, which is tree-based diet. Ardipithecus, Ramidus, and Anamensis, Australopithecus Anamensis, have more apes diet, which means leaves and fruits. And then it's the species Australopithecus afarensis, which for the first time started to venture into more grass-based diet described as C4 diet, which includes sedges and grasses, which also speaks to the type of environment they were frequenting, in a way. And then by 2.5 million years ago, you see this dichotomy between what we call the paranthropus, or the robust group, which became specialists of that hard, abrasive diet, or C4 diet, and then the genus Homo, which became more mixed feeder, probably because it involved consuming a lot of meat with the invention of stone tools. But P. boisei, which is Paranthropus boisei, became the ultimate C4 consumer, including up to 80% of grasses and sedges or anything that may have been a C4 at the time. And then, therefore, overall, you see the C4 diet being included as you go from the emergence of hominins splitting from the chimpanzees sometime around 7 million years ago all the way to today. And that was one of the key and fun fundamental changes that we observed as we explore human evolution. And that was happening concomitant with dental and jaw size and shape modifications. And all that was published only in June 25, uh, 25, uh, on June 25, 2013, on the cover page of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences as four papers by many, many scientists, including myself. I don't see anyone moving, so I guess I will continue. <laughs> but what are really the questions? As a paleoanthropologist, I like to think about why do I do the job I do in the first place? Why is it important? And what are really the questions that we are interested to answer? Well, the first is we want to understand the anatomy of our body, not only today, but how it became what it is today. So anatomy and how they, understanding how they looked, I mean, our ancestors, is important. That anatomy is going to affect or influence your mode of locomotion, the way you move around. And then combined, they are going to affect your behavior. And all of that would determine where you live, and where you live will determine your diet somehow, which then in turn determine your anatomy. So it's a circle that goes 
back into the origin of our anatomies. Therefore, diet is one of the key and fundamental issues in the history of human evolution, in the study of human evolution. If that is the case, therefore, what do apes eat today? And apes include many gorillas, chimps, humans, orangs, etc. What do they eat? Well, gorillas eat mostly leaves, and that is C3. I will come to the difference between C3 and C4 later. But they eat by and large leaves. Chimps consume fruits even when they live in the savanna environment. They can live in the savanna environment, but they don't really consume grasses. They are by and large fruit eaters. Humans eat everything, and my colleague Christina will be talking a lot about that, telling you more. So my interest here tonight is, if, our, if gorillas do that, C3, chimps do, humans do everything, when did eating everything start, is the question I'm asking tonight. But diet is really important because it's not only about the calories that we try to gain or lose. Homo sapiens are crazy, they try to do both ways. They take it in and they take it out again. They did not have that, that type of uh, opportunity at the time. But it's not about the calories, but it is the interface between the, the organism, the humans or the human ancestors, and their environment. That's something that goes to your mouth. So it's going to affect, and it's going to be the source of a fierce competition between you, the organism, and your environment, and other species in that environment. Therefore, it's going to in turn affect the selective pressure that are acting upon you as you evolve through time. So it's beyond the calories. I mean the issue of diet. So when did we start to consume grass-based diet, which is my talk today, or meat, or cooked food, etc., is really a very important question in the study of human evolution. But how do we know then what an early human ancestor ate three, four, five, six million years ago. There are many approaches that have been employed over the past uh, few decades. The first being a very straightforward approach, that is to look at the gross anatomy of the fossils. You look at them, if you have massive jaws and supporting muscles, like the nutcrackers, they were named, the Nyanthropus boisei or Paranthropus boisei, then you would assume they were uh, feeding on hard and abrasive diet. It's a pretty straightforward approach. It sometimes works, it sometimes may not. But by looking at the gross anatomy of a muscle, uh, on the muscles, you can infer the type of diet consumed by uh, an animal. Another approach is to look at the teeth size, size, shape, and topography. If you have sharp cusps like this, it would be used for shearing, say leaves. If you have more uh, lower topography, then you would be mostly grinding maybe fruits like in pan. So this is another approach that also has been widely used to investigate diet in earlier hominins. Why? Because all we have in terms of fossils are the teeth and the bones. We don't have the soft tissues or the, the, the other evidence for the diet. You can also look into the archaeological record. If you have stone tools, then it must have served some purpose, maybe removing uh, meat of the uh, bones or uh, butchering carcasses, etc. Or if you have cut market bones, it can show you that meat was being consumed by early human ancestors. So the archaeological record was also used to determine what an animal may have eaten two, three, four, five million years ago. Uh, more recently, we were, we've been ex investigating what we call dental microware. These are those fine-grained structures that are left in your teeth by the food item you consume. So if you're feeding on hard and abrasive diet, you will have these very complex features with pits in them, whereas more scratches will indicate soft fruits and leaves. So, these are techniques that have been used for many years to study fossil diet, but you can obviously see the limitations. So, what we tried to do in this publication that we published a few uh, months ago 
is to look into the chemistry of what the animals ate. This is a more direct evidence which would tell you the chemical composition of the diet that was consumed three million years ago by species A or C is going to be like this. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we take samples, up to two milligrams, and then we use a mass spectrometer to compare the heavy versus the light carbon isotope. How does it work? Well, as you know, there are two types of photosynthetic pathways. One is called C3, the second is C4, and C3 plants are basically the tropical trees, including that have leaves and fruits, bushes, forbs, etc. The C4s are tropical, tropical grasses that, have, uh, that also include sedges. And then you have the camp plants that are uh, succulent plants and cactuses and pineapples that are mostly in desert, desert, mostly desert plants, but we're not concerned about this today. But how do we distinguish a C3, which is tropical trees, bushes, and forbs diet, versus this one? I will come back to that, but please note that I'm not using radioactive carbon here. These are stabilized stops. It sometimes gets confused. Stabilized stops to investigate the food chemistry. Basically, what we're trying to do is, can we tell if an animal was eating, by and large, grasses and sedges, or tree-based diet, which would include fruits and leaves? That's the question. And let me take you, if you've forgotten uh, uh, your you know, photosynthesis courses from high school or, I don't know, from college. This is how it works. I said C4 and C3, they don't have the same photosynthetic, uh, photosynthesis pathways. They have different pathways. The first one, C3, which, is, which includes most plants, and this has been evolving for millions and millions of years, whereas the C4 is a newcomer. What is C3? You know, photosynthesis is pretty simple. You have hydrogen, uh, you have water and carbon dioxide. You use light to produce sugar. How do you do that? You fix carbon dioxide using an enzyme called Rubisco, which means ribulose biphosphate carboxylase. It's just an enzyme. And then it converts it into sugar using ATP and NADPH. These are basically the energy currencies of photosynthesis. So when you do that, you result in sugar, which has three carbons. It's called three-carbon chain molecule. But what the problem with this Rubisco enzyme is, it's not only, not only does it fix CO2, which is useful for producing sugar, it also fixes oxygen. And fixing this requires energy, so it wastes energy. It also has uh, and that wasting energy and then producing, uh, no, fixing oxygen, which is not going to serve any purpose and sometimes is harmful, is called photorespiration. So that's why we call the C3 type of photosynthesis pathway is inefficient. Why? It's losing energy and then it's, uh, it's, not, it's fixing carbon dioxide, uh, CO, uh, oxygen also. So the bottom line here is, because in the Calvin cycle, this enzyme is fixing oxygen, it's causing photorespiration, which means you're wasting energy by fixing oxygen, among other problems. Good. So to mitigate this problem, what the C4 plants did is, by the way, all that process, the Calvin cycle is happening here in the mesophyll, which is the upper part of the leaves. It's happening here. What these guys did is, okay, we're not going to use Rubisco, we're going to use a chemical called PEP, which means phosphenol pyruvate. And what it does is, it sucks the carbon dioxide, and then it produces a four-carbon chain molecule called mallet. And it's still not doing the carbon cycle to produce sugar. Before doing this, it passes through, stage, through this stage. And what what, what is happening here is it's, not, it's getting the carbon dioxide from the air, it's producing a carbon molecule called mallet, and then it sends the mallet down to this special cells called bundle sheet cells, 
And then this carbon cycle process is happening deep in the leaves. What are the benefits? Well, first of all, the PEP does not fix oxygen. It fixes only CO2. So it's not wasting any energy. Second, because this is deep in the leaves, it's a closed system. Closed system means once you have the carbon dioxide inside from the mallet carries the carbon dioxide, there is no going out. So all the carbon that comes in is going to be used by the plant. Therefore, there is no carbon dioxide coming from outside entering here. So it's a completely closed system. As a result, you will have less heavy carbon, carbon-13 here, and you will have more heavy carbon-13 here. Why? Because there is a fractionation going on, there is a discrimination against the heavy carbon that's happening here, because if you have to choose light or heavy, you will choose a light, because you can process it easily. It's like carrying something. But in here, because the system is closed, all the carbon that goes in is going to be processed. As a result, you will have more heavy carbon in the C4 plants as opposed to the C3 plants. This is the basics of the C3 versus the C4. So the crux of this point is C4 plants will have more heavy carbon, C3 plants have less heavy carbon. This is the basis of isotopic analysis. Given that, therefore, you can calculate the ratio between the heavy and the light carbon, which is the heavy is the 13, the light is this one, and then it's expressed in per mil. When you do that, C3 plants will have a ratio between minus 22 to 35 with an average of minus 2, minus 26, and C4 plants will have a value of minus 13 on average. As you can see, they don't overlap. Why am I talking about this? Because when I say C3, they are going to, by and large, be represented by grasses. So if I can identify in an early hominin that it has more C3, it was consuming more trees or fruits, leaves. If I have more C4, then it was involved in consuming grasses. That's why this process is very important. So these are the values, but there is further fractionation when you produce your enamel. So an enamel of a C3 feeding animal will be on average minus 13, so it will be more depleted. Why? Because to start with, there is less heavy carbon, whereas the enamel in the C4 feeding animal will have more heavy carbon. That's why it's a positive number. Actually, it could be a negative depending on that. So again, to remind you, C3s are tropical trees, leaves, and fruits, bushes, forbs, and then here you have tropical grasses, sedges, and thanks to Christina, sugar canes also are included. That's why, that's why they produce very, uh, very concentrated sugar. So that's the basics. So to recap, you have an atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is, which is minus 7.5 per mil. Through the C3, you will have trees that are minus 26. As you go down, in the, up in the food chain, the browser will have an enamel with a minus 14. The predator will have exactly the same thing and the same thing here. So giraffes who feed a lot of, who feed on leaves will have this type of value, minus 14, and wildebeest, which feeds on grasses, will have this type of values. Given that background, let me come back to what we did in our research. What we did is that we sampled hominin enamel cap from across Africa. And here are some of the pictures that you can see. And you really do minimum, minimal damage. If you can tell, this is before sampling, this is after sampling. And here is some of our team members sampling the uh, two milligram or so uh, enamel uh, powder from this tooth. And that's all. The damage is really minimal. We did 11 species between 4.4 and 1.3 million years. These are all hominins. And then we've sampled 175 T's so far, and the sample size has increased by 250%. This gives you an idea of what we did in terms of sampling. And I should underscore that what I'm presenting is the result of a collaborative work of all these people. 
And these are the titles of the four, the four papers published in this, uh, in this journal uh, a few months ago. So I am basically representing all these people in the list. Uh, you can see me here or somewhere around here. But this is a work conducted by many, many, many people. So I here stand in front of you representing all those people. So what are the results? So if we know that uh, the C4 eating animals are eating grasses for the reasons I explained, the C3 eating plants are mainly based on uh, uh, trees, leaves, and fruits, what happens when we look Oh, the results I showed you, by the way, are experimental on modern animals, so we know what those animals eat. Now, let's look at the fossils from 3.5 million years ago, from the site of Hadar and Dikika, where I work at. So, what are the giraffes doing? You can see the various giraffes, very negative values. It makes sense because they eat trees, uh, leaves, and, uh, no, anyway, they feed on trees. Look at the wildebeest, very positive values. So this shows that the approach can be used for fossils first. These are the same age as Australopithecus afarensis. And what is afarensis doing? It's all over. It's consuming very C3-like diet all the way to C4-like diet. And there is a lot of variability. So it was a mixed feeder with considerable variability with an, an average of minus 7 percent, uh, 7 per mil. This is really a neat result. Why is it a neat result? Well, because if you look at the Turkana data, the one I just showed you is from Hadar in Ethiopia. If you look at the data from the Turkana data, uh, from the Turkana site in Kenya, look at anamensis, which is anatomically very similar to an afarensis, is very depleted, i.e., it's feeding on C3 trees and leaves and fruits, like the chimpanzees, basically. But if you go further in time, here is time, from 4 million years all the way to zero, and here is the uh, carbon uh, content expressed as per mil. So anamensis is very ape-like. Pladiops, which is the same age as Afarensis, is again very variable, but consumes both C4 and C3, so it's a mixed feeder. As you go up in time, Proanthropus ethiopicus, which is a robust megadont species, is continuing that C4 trend here, and Boise Texas, takes it to the extreme, consuming up to 80% of grasses. Homo, on the other hand, which is us, 2.3 million years ago, continues to be a mixed feeder, which probably is due to the fact that they were including more meat. By that time, we have clear evidence of stone tool use. So if you are consuming meat of animals that consume trees, leaves, fruits, then you will have the same signature. If you put all the data together, that exists today, you have Ardipithecus ramidas here, which is really chimpanzee-like. Very C3 diet. If you look at Anamensis, very C3-like. Afarensis and Platyops are the first creatures to really venture into the grassland environment, or at least exploit the resources they're in. And what's fascinating, I think, for me, is, so you have that, Africans continues that pattern, but what's fascinating is Boise yeah, takes it again to the extreme of grass eating, whereas Homo does both. So why is this result important? Well, first of all, when we try to understand what makes us human, as I said at the beginning, it's anatomy, diet, locomotion, behavior, etc., environment, determining when that type of mixed feeding, which characterizes us, we take it to the extreme, obviously, emerged is important. Because the way to understand humans is to look at how we differ from chimpanzees because we share a common ancestor, ancestor seven million years ago. So if we are to understand ourselves, 
when we split off from those species in terms of our locomotor adaptation when we became upright walkers, in terms of our dentition, which is tiny and uh, small compared to others, in terms of our brain, which is huge compared to the chimpanzees. Those are the questions. But in terms of what we ate and when we started to venture into a different type of diet, this is the evidence for the first time that we're presenting in the study. Because it shows a major shift in terms of our adaptation when we look at the big picture of human evolution. So what was the source of C4 for AI for instance? Well, clearly, they lived in woodland, woodland environment, and I'm sure there were grasses adjacent to that woodland environment. So they could definitely consume sedges and grass-based diet, etc., etc. We cannot really pinpoint to that specific type of grass, but we have an idea that they were uh, interacting with their environment differently, particularly compared to the chimps who are always depending on the trees. When you always depend on a tree, when that tree disappears, then you disappear. I think Afarensis ventured into this type of environment for the first time, which then ultimately continued to the genus Homo, then Heidelbergensis, etc., etc., to create who we are. So this is really an important information as to what our ancestors were doing 3.5 million years ago. But in addition to the vegetation, if you remember, about three years ago, we published, my team from the Kika published, this cut market bones that showed that Afarensis was the first creature to, uh, well, in our history, obviously, the first hominin species to start using stone, to, to consume meat using stone tools. So, it's possible, therefore, that consuming meat of C4 feeding carcass uh, animals could also cause the increased amount of uh, C4 uh, content that you see in the species' uh, teeth. So, a combination of meat eating and venturing into a new environment by about 3.5 million years ago is showing that Afarens was the first to venture into this type of environment. And when we published these results, we did not have the chemical composition of the species, but now it's coming together. So finally, the conclusions would be that Ardipithecus had very chimp-like diet. So Ardipithecus may have slightly shifted toward this being human, but it kept small brain like the chimpanzees. It was still had a grasping toe. It had a diet very, which, is, which was very ape-like, C, C3 diet, etc., etc. But Afarens Ardipithecus, therefore, was, in terms of its diet, was chimp-like, like Anamensis. Anamensis, in spite of its similarities in terms of its anatomy to Afarensis, had not yet ventured into this type of diet either. So it was this species for the first time to really consume and go to the C4 world for the first time around 3.5 million years ago. And then meat consumption may have contributed to this fact, and then P. boisei, however, this is Paranthropus boisei, takes this adaptation, passing through Ethiopia to the extreme of consuming almost 80% grasses, at least C4 diet. And then Homo, therefore, continues to be a mixed feeder, including meat and more as we know it. And today, you know what happens. But uh, there is a better person to speak about today, who is Christina Warner. So I will stop here, and if you had questions, I will entertain them later. Thank you. So I'm going to talk um, about some more recent periods. I'm going to talk specifically about food and the foods that we eat. Um, food is something that unites all of us. It's something we all consume. It's something that we share in common. Um, it delights us. It excites us. It nourishes us, and it sustains us. But I think... One question I often think to myself is, well, how did we come to eat like this, um, following on Zerai's talk? How did we come to eat out of this modern supermarket? And as an archaeologist who researches ancient diets, I often get asked, what should we eat? What are we evolved to eat? And this is a really important question, but I have to admit, it is extraordinarily difficult to answer. 
the Paleolithic period of our genus, Homo, spans more than two million years. And for much of that period, our climate has been cycling through warm periods and ice ages. And I've drawn a simplified version of these cycles at the top of this slide showing the approximate uh, intensity and duration of these changes in climate. Um, over the past two million years. And for about the last 900,000 years, during the late Pleistocene, these cycles have become longer and more intense. And the cycling has had different effects around the world. Um, it has raised and lowered global temperatures. It has changed ocean and air currents. It has joined and split continents. Um, it's t made some areas temporarily dry and uninhabitable, other places covered in ice, and other places lush and bountiful. So as we reflect on the period of human evolution, the one thing that has been constant is climatic instability and fluctuation. And during the late Pleistocene, many large animals went extinct. In Australia alone, 88 species of megafauna went extinct, animals like the giant marsupial lion, the two-ton giant wombat-like creature, the diprotodon. In the Americas, more than 38 megafauna genera died out, and they include the woolly mammoth, the giant ground sloth, and the American horse. And humans also likely came to the brink of extinction many times during this period of intense climatic fluctuation. But we managed to survive, unlike our cousins, the Neanderthals. Perhaps it is unsurprising then that what characterizes humans above all else is our versatility. It is this versatility, both biological and cultural, that has allowed us to colonize the globe, even inhabiting the most remote and extreme locations on Earth and space. Since the tail end of the late Pleistocene, during the Upper Paleolithic, the pace of human innovation has dramatically increased. And I'm going to focus on human diets of the past 50,000 years, and especially the past 10,000 years, when human experimentation with domestication turned the human population from 100% foragers to almost 100% agriculturalists and pastoralists. And specifically, I'm going to talk about how our food choices went from this to this in about 500 generations. We've mainly done this in three ways. The first is by modifying our own genes in order to be able to digest new types of foods. And the second is by modifying the genes of plants and animals that we want to eat in order to make them more edible for us. And third is by processing our foods using technology to further expand our food options. I'm only going to have time to cover a few highlights, but I think they may include a few surprises. And so let's start with the first one. Let's start with human genetic adaptations. <clears throat> so milk is a food for infants. It contains the sugar lactose, which is actually two sugars, glucose and galactose, that are linked by a chemical bond. Now, we can't absorb linked sugars, and so we produce a special enzyme called lactase that acts as a kind of molecular scissors that cuts these two sugars apart. Now, all baby mammals produce lactase. <clears throat> um, but it's not just human babies. Also, kittens and puppies, any mammal really produces lactase, and this is what helps us drink milk as infants. And as part of the weaning process, the gene that produces lactase gets turned off, such that after infancy, after the cessation of lactation, this gene becomes turned off, and you no longer produce lactase, and so you can no longer break these chemical bonds. And in fact, if you consume lactose as an adult after your lactase gene has been turned off, this lactase will travel to your colon where bacteria will ferment it, producing gas and acids that cause the symptoms of lactose intolerance. Um, <clears throat> now, at the end of the late Pleistocene, all humans on Earth were lactose intolerant. Even today, most of the world's population, somewhere between 75 and 90 percent of people living on Earth, are lactose intolerant. But as you know, some of us can drink milk for our whole lives. Our lactase genes have been permanently switched on because of mutations in this genetic switch. This is a condition called lactase persistence, and these mutations evolved during the Neolithic period. 
The scientists have now mapped the part of the human genome that controls lactase production, and this molecular switch that turns it on and off. And we've discovered five mutations in human populations around the world that explain almost all cases of lactase persistence. And these mutations trace back to three homelands. The first is in Europe and the Middle East, the second is in Saudi Arabia, and there are three in East Africa. And each of these places has a long archaeological record of intensive pastoralism of either cattle or camels. Now, with respect to the European variant, um, it was thought initially that this trait must have evolved with the domestication of cattle about 8,000 years ago, somewhere in Turkey or the Middle East, and then spread with the first farmers into Europe as they traveled in around 7,500 years ago. And this is what all the archaeologists agreed, and we all thought this was a really clever idea, and this must be how it happened. And then in 2007, a really interesting paper was published. This is an ancient DNA investigation of the first farmers in Europe. So this is the, the linear, pottery, or linear, linear pottery culture, the LBK culture. And they conducted uh, ancient DNA analysis on these populations to see if they had these genetic markers for lactase persistence. And what they found was they didn't. And then there were subsequent studies, because they thought they must really be there, let's test some more populations, and they kept finding the same result. The earliest farmers in Europe do not have this lactase persistent mutation. And instead, the earliest known evidence for lactase persistence occurs 2,000 years later, and it's found um, in Sweden and in the Basque country of Spain. And this was quite a surprise. Um, and today among cattle, the greatest diversity in milk-producing genes is found in Scandinavia. This also suggests that this region was really important for establishing modern dairy breeds, and in today, modern Scandinavia has the highest rates of lactase persistence in the world. So more than 80% of people in Scandinavia today um, have these genetic mutations to allow them to digest milk. And this actually makes sense, because life in the far north is quite hard. Um, Food, and especially plants and carbohydrates, are often in very short supply in cold climates. And milk, in addition, to, in addition to being a reliable source of protein and fat and also clean water, is actually a source of sugar. It's a source of lactose. And so by drinking milk in the form of milk itself or yogurt or soft cheeses that still contain lactose, um, this becomes then a source of sugar that's available year-round. And in some ways, it's like a sugar substitute or a plant substitute, excuse me. Um, one thing that my research group is currently doing is we're trying to understand the later periods of this. So if, if these lactase persistence genes start showing up about uh, 5,000 years ago, then when, do, when does it start to reach modern levels that we see today? And so we've been analyzing medieval populations in Central Europe to try to understand this period um, and, and try to understand when these alleles stabilized. And what we find is that actually, um, by 1,000 years ago, we see the same levels of lactase persistence as we do today. And that indicates that this evolution actually occurred extremely rapidly on the order of a few thousand years. And this is something that I find really fascinating is we tend to think of evolution over very long time scales, but in some cases it actually occurs quite rapidly. And it's kind of amazing that if you think in Europe that over the span of just a few thousand years, we went from basically no one having lactase persistence alleles to in some places more than 80% of people carrying uh, these mutations. That's truly rapid um, human evolution. And what's even more amazing still is that the most recent evidence from East Africa suggests that the period of evolution there in lactase persistence was even more rapid still. There's a lot of exciting research coming out in this area um, right now. But this is only part of the dairy story. There's another really important piece of this puzzle that I've barely mentioned. That is microbes, these bacteria that live in your gut. Remember I said that it's bacterial fermentation in your colon that causes the painful symptoms of lactose intolerance. And theoretically, if you were to drink a half liter of milk and you were completely lactose intolerant and you digested all of that milk completely by uh, colonic fermentation, you would actually produce eight liters of hydrogen gas, um, which is terrible. Um, and, but most people, even people who are lactose intolerant, don't produce anywhere near that amount. And so, so what's the difference? And it turns out that 
the gut microbes make a big, a big difference. In fact, there are people who are lactase non-persistent, so they do not have these mutations, they turn off their lactase gene, and yet they don't experience the symptoms of lactose intolerance. So clearly, there is something different about their gut microbiome, where they aren't producing the acids, and they aren't producing the gases, and they don't have the symptoms. And this is something that um, we're quite interested in figuring out. Now, the gut microbiome is extraordinarily complex, and we don't exactly know which bacteria of the thousands of species that live in your colon, which ones are doing this? There's a lot of work going on right now to try to figure this out, because if we could figure out this process, we could put together maybe a cocktail of some of these bacteria to give to people as a probiotic that would enable them then to be able to digest this milk without all the negative symptoms of lactose intolerance. Another example of very recent human genetic evolution has to do with starch. Now, starch is a polymer of glucose sugars linked up into very long chains. And as with lactose, we can't absorb linked sugars, and so we have to break them up. And to do this, we use a different type of molecular scissors, this time called amylase. Now, all humans produce amylase, and we make it for our entire lives. It's an essential enzyme for life. Um, and on average, we have more copies of the amylase gene and therefore make more amylase enzyme than chimpanzees. And this is part of the evidence that suggests that starch was a really important part of human evolution. But what's also interesting is that some human groups have more amylase gene copies than others. In fact, in 2007, a research team at Arizona State University found that some human populations have many, many more copies of amylase gene than others, and that the number of gene copies actually correlates with the amount of starch in these populations' diets. So, as I mentioned before, chimpanzees just have one copy on each chromosome. But they found that in populations that have, um, have low starch diets, human groups, they have an average of five copies. In other human groups that eat a lot of starch, for example, in Japanese populations, they have on average seven copies. But they found amazingly that in some individuals, they have up to 15 copies of the amylase gene in their genome. This is truly extraordinary. This is a 15-fold difference in the amount of amylase that they produce. And so in this way, these are two examples of how we as humans very recently, on the order of thousands of years, have rapidly developed dietary adaptations to enable us to extract uh, energy out of foods that we either couldn't digest efficiently or couldn't digest at all in the past. Now this brings me now to the topic of domestication. Um, I think and I hope I'm not too biased, maybe I'm a little biased, but I think domestication is one of humanity's greatest innovations. I think it is so important and so fascinating. Um, but I also think it's quite misunderstood. Um, I think most people are uh, familiar with the fact that we tend to make domesticated plants bigger. So this is an example of wild strawberries. They're actually quite small compared to domesticated strawberries, which are actually a hybrid of a European and a North American wild strawberry. Um, and we do that so there's just more to eat. That's, that's quite simple. Um, and we tend to make domesticated animals smaller, and that's so they're less dangerous and less likely to kill us. But of course, there's a few exceptions, like chickens and guinea pigs, which we also try to make bigger. Um, but domestication is much more than this. In many cases, we have literally invented our own food. We've created foods that didn't even exist before. And a really good example of this is maize, which here in North America we call corn. Now, we're all familiar with corn on the cob, except wild maize doesn't have a cob. That's something we created. Wild maize is that little plant there on the left. It's called teosinte, and I'm going to zoom in on it. Now, it looks nothing like the corn that we're familiar with. It's woody. It has these gloom-covered kernels. They have this odd triangular shape. They're extremely hard. I can assure you, I have tried to eat them. They are very hard to eat. Um, you have to smash them open with a rock. They're not something anyone would have ever been interested in. They're not worth the time of opening. And I think that's what ancient people in um, Mesoamerica probably would have thought too. Oh, sure, thanks. Um, and so what's really interesting is that if you look at the earliest evidence of maize consumption in Mesoamerica, it's not teosinte kernels that we find. Instead, what we find are bits of stalk that have been chewed up and spit out. 
And the reason for this is because maize is actually related to sugar cane. It's very sugary. This plant stores a lot of sugar in its stalk, and so you can actually chew on the stalk and suck out the sugars, and then spit out the indigestible fibrous parts. And that's exactly what we find in the earliest dry caves.、Um, When、uh, Mesoamericans first started experimenting, that's about 6,000 years ago. But later, there was a mutation that occurred, and it was probably a spontaneous mutation in the Teosinte gloom architecture gene, which made this gloom burst open, and it made the kernel available more readily. Well, this probably is what got people's attention. They started focusing on the seed now rather than the stalk. And then what happens over time is selecting for larger and larger kernels. We eventually get domesticated maize, and this, of course,、um, through artificial selection, allowed people then to build the、um, societies that we're familiar with in ancient Mesoamerica, such as the ancient Olmecs, the Maya, the Mixtecs, the Zapotecs, and the Aztecs. But maize isn't the only food that we've invented. We've actually invented quite a few.、Um, take broccoli, which is another great example. Now you may not recognize it, but this is wild broccoli here on the left. It's also wild cabbage, wild cauliflower, kale, kohlrabi, and Brussels sprouts. All of these vegetables have been domesticated from the same parent. In fact, they're all the same species. They're just different cultivars. We've just selected the different parts of the same plant that we want to eat. And in the case of broccoli, we have so strongly selected for flowers that you can't even really recognize what it is anymore. This is the same plant, except just lots and lots of flowers all stuck together. And if you don't believe me, I think you should go to the grocery store. And if you put your broccoli into a vase of water, you can actually get it to bloom,、um, and it's quite beautiful.、Um, but we've also made、uh, new foods in other ways. So when you look out over a wild landscape, and this is a photograph that I took from Gila Nakit's cave, it's in Oaxaca, Mexico. It's a very early rock shelter site of some of the earliest human occupation in Mexico.、Um, people would have lived here about 7,000 years ago, and the landscape would have looked just about the same.、Um, and when you look out at this wild landscape, the, the most immediate problem is not a lack of plants. This landscape is full of plants,、um, but the problem really is that, is that most of them are poisonous or indigestible. Um, and you see, like like wild animals, plants are also trying to kill you.、Um, but while the plants want, or while the animals want to eat you, the plants are just trying to stay alive. They don't want to be your next dinner. And so, in order to discourage you from eating them, and other pests from eating them, they produce a number of natural pesticides in their roots, stems, leaves, and seeds. Now, we call many of these things flavors,、um, but some of them we also call toxins and poisons. So take ricin for example.、Uh, this plant really does not want you to eat it.、Uh, ricin is produced by the castor bean, and it's extremely poisonous. Eight beans are enough to to, to be fatal. So watch out for castor beans.、Um, another famous example is, of course, the terribly poisonous nightshade. Every part of this plant is deadly, from its roots to its leaves to its fruits. It contains a cocktail of alkaloid poisons. Uh, including atropine, which causes paralysis, and solanine. That's a potent antifungal, and it's also a pesticide poison.、Um, what's perhaps less well known is that it's a member of the plant family Solanaceae. That's the same family from which we have domesticated tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, hot chili peppers, and tobacco.、Um, these plants also contain toxic alkaloids and other bioactive compounds. But humans have bred them out of the parts that we like to eat, as in tomatoes and potatoes, or we've refined and concentrated them for a particular effect, as in the case of capsaicin and hot chili peppers, or for nicotine and tobacco. But the poisons are still present in these plants, and that's why you can't eat potato leaves.、Uh, they still contain very high concentrations of solanine,、um, and this is also the reason why people traditionally peel potatoes.、Um, We often think it's to get the dirt off, but that's not it at all. See, if the potatoes get too close to the surface, they'll start making solanine in their in their skin.、Um, you can often tell if this has happened because they also start producing chlorophyll in their skin, which turns them green. So if you see a green spot on your tomato, you shouldn't eat it, not because of the chlorophyll, but because of the solanine that it's producing.、Um, but it's it's not easy to to kill yourself on solanine because it tastes really terrible. So you probably wouldn't get that that far eating. Uh, solanine um, 
and potatoes. Um, but it can make you quite ill. Um, tomatoes have a related toxin called tomatine, which they produce. It's a little bit more benign, but it's found in all of the green parts of the plants, especially its leaves. Um, the same principle applies to other plants too. So here we have wild carrot on the left. Some of you may recognize it. I, like we call it Queen's Anne's lace. Um, and it's really small and woody. Um, it's low in sugar, and it contains high quantities of a pesticide called falcarindiol. Um, but we've bred this mostly out of domesticated carrots. They do have some in the outermost uh, layer of the carrot. That's again why we peel carrots. Um, not to get the dirt off, but to remove this bitter-tasting uh, pesticide. And although you may not realize it, um, apricots and almonds are actually very closely related. They're both members of the prunus genus. Um, but in almonds, what we've done is we have bred them to eliminate the cyanide-producing glycosides in their seeds, while in apricots, we have bred them for bigger and thicker fruits. So like broccoli and carrots, uh, domesticated almonds and apricots are fundamentally different from their wild progenitors, and in many ways, a human invention. And we've done this over and over again all throughout the world. We have expanded our food options by either making them bigger or improving the parts that we want to eat, or by genetically altering them to remove their poisons. And this brings me to the final adaptation I'm going to talk about, which is food processing and technology. Now, we've been processing our foods for a very long time. First, by using simple chopping and cutting stone tools, and later using much more sophisticated materials and techniques. We've also been cooking our food for a very long time. Hominids have exper experimented with fire for at least 1.6 million years. And members of the genus Homo have habitually used fire for at least 400,000 years. And in the Middle and Upper Paleolithic, we start finding direct evidence of plant cooking and processing. So for example, starch grain analysis of dental calculus at Shanidara and Spee confirms the importance of plants in Neanderthal diets including grains, and suggests that some of these plants may have even been cooked or boiled. And starch grain analysis of groundstone tools at upper Paleolithic sites in Europe has shown that humans were grinding roots and seeds into a kind of flour 20,000 years before the invention of agriculture. Grinding is actually an extraordinarily useful technology and one that has allowed us to exploit even more food resources. So many roots and nuts, such as manioc and acorns, um, would be excellent human foods, except for the fact they contain high concentration of cyanide-producing toxins and tannins. Um, but unlike carrots and potatoes, humans didn't breed these toxins out. Instead, we found them useful because it prevented other pests from eating them. And so what we did instead is we developed ways of soaking and leaching out these uh, toxins these toxins using technology. So for example, the canela people of Brazil, they peel and grate their manioc and then they put them into these long tube baskets and run water through it to leach out um, these toxins from their, their manioc plants. And similarly, many native peoples in, in California um, produce nutritious acorn flour by uh, grinding the, the acorns into a fine powder and then leaching out the tannins with water. Um, cooking and processing, however, isn't just about removing toxins. It can actually improve the nutrition of the food itself. And I think a really good example of this is something called nixtamalization, which is a food processing technique that was invented in ancient um, Mesoamerica. See, one of the problems with maize is that it contains, it actually contains quite a lot of niacin, which is a B vitamin that you require for life. But um, unfortunately, this B vitamin is in a form that's not bioavailable um, when you eat it. And so if you try to build a civilization on maize, um, what happens is you end up with a B vitamin deficiency unless you have a lot of other foods that you can supplement it with. And this is a really big problem. It causes a, a disease, called, a nutritional disease called pellagra. Um, this is something that really plagued the U.S. prison system for a long time in the 19th century before people figured this out. Um, but what the people in ancient Mesoamerica did was something really clever. One thing they realized was that if you took maize and you boil it, um, 
and you add to it something called slaked lime, which is you make that by burning limestone. It's actually it's sort of like part of the plaster making process. And if you add that to boiling water and to your corn, what ends up happening is, well, first of all, it loosens the, um, the outermost part of the kernel so that it's easier to grind. But it also um, makes this niacin bioavailable. And suddenly, maize has a very large amount of niacin, and you no longer have this B vitamin deficiency. And it also increases the calcium content of your maize 700%. So it dramatically improves the nutritious quality of food. And this particular technique actually got invented over and over again. So in ancient Mesoamerica, they used um, limestone, called it Um But in North America, where people were also processing corn, they used wood ashes. Um, basically, you just need to get an alkaline, an alkaline solution. And so this was hit on over and over again. But food processing also has a dark side. Um, it can also reduce the nutritional value of common foods, and sometimes very severely. So take, for example, wheat. Like other grains, um, wheat has three main parts, and that's the bran, the endosperm, and the germ. And basically, the bran is just the, the outermost covering of the, of the seed, and it protects it from the environment. Um, the germ is the embryonic part of the plant. This is the part of the plant that's going to sprout. These are the embryonic leaves. And then the endosperm is essentially just starch. And this is what the baby plant uses to feed and grow on until it's large enough to photosynthesize on its own. Um, and during milling, what ends up happening when we, when we prepare flowers today uh, out of wheat, um, we separate these three parts. So we, put all of the, we take out all the bran, and we put it in things like animal feed, and we add it to some health uh, breakfast cereals. And then we take the germ out, and we put the germ into um, we, jars and sell it at health food stores as a nutritional supplement. And, and then we take what's left, which is just the starch, and we make it into white flour, and we make rolls and donuts and buns and all sorts of other processed foods out of them. And, and this is really unfortunate, because if you look at what where the vitamins are in wheat, they're almost all in the bran and the germ. So this is where 74% of fiber in wheat is in the bran and the germ. Almost all of the minerals and vitamins are in the bran and the germ. And if you look at what's left when we get to the white flour, it's where most of the carbohydrates, sugars are, um, most of the sodium. There's not a lot there. We've really stripped out most of the, uh, the nutrition. Um, and that's why white flour um, usually has to be enriched with vitamin supplements, because during this process, we remove most of the nutritional quality. And you might be wondering, well, why do we do this in the first place? And it really comes down to two things. Um, one is aesthetics. It makes a lighter colored flour if you remove the bran and the germ. But also it increases shelf life, because the bran and the germ are more bioactive, they contain more oils, and they will, um, the flour will spoil more quickly if you leave it in. But if you are interested in, if you're more interested in nutrition than you are in aesthetics or shelf life, then what you can do is look for whole grain wheat, because that contains the bran, the germ, and the endosperm together in their natural proportions, and you get the full nutritional benefit of the wheat. But perhaps the most alarming trend in modern food processing today uh, is the extreme concentration of certain nutrients, uh, especially sugars. So the most common and perhaps most harmful example is, is soda, which is actually really a kind of liquid candy. Um, soda is really just this absurd concentration of a natural product that is almost always rare in nature, and that's sugar. We are not evolved to eat large quantities of sugar. In fact, before the 18th century, few people had ever even tasted refined sugar. Now, fruits and honey contain some forms of sugar, but they also contain a lot of other things. They contain fiber and pectins and complex oligosaccharides, and they aren't really comparable to the kinds of refined sugars that you see in soda. Also, the quantity of, so of sugar in soda is, is really draw-dropping. So, for example, if you take this this lovely 20-ounce um, Sunkist. Um, it contains 72 grams of sugar, um, which is really astounding. So 72 grams, that's 36 sugar packets. So I just want you to imagine in your mind, you're preparing coffee in the morning, you're just putting in 36 sugar packets. It's really quite absurd. Um, and like, what's even more crazy is if you think, if you had to go, if you were an ancient person, and you had to go acquire this much sugar from a natural source. Well, you will have to work really hard because this is how much sugar cane you would have to eat 
in order to consume 72 grams of sugar. It would almost be physically impossible for you to do it. I mean, it would take some serious effort. Um, and at least in Oklahoma, where I live, what I see is actually not that many people drinking sodas of this size. I see a lot of people with 44-ounce sodas, um, which is just crazy. And um, that's about, let's see, well, this is a six feet of sugar cane. That's about 91 packets of sugar, which is just crazy. You're almost baking a cake at that point. So um, just keep in mind how much, how much sugar is in it. The real problem is, you see, is that we can't modulate our digestion of sugar. I mean, this was something we never had in abundance in the past. So we don't really have any defenses to sugar. We digest it immediately. Um, and it causes extreme spikes in our blood sugar. And it wreaks havoc on our pancreas and our long-term metabolism. So from biological and behavior ingen behavioral ingenuity to the perils of plenty, this is how we as human have eaten our way out of lam wild landscapes and into a modern supermarket. And for the first time in human history, starvation is no longer the most pressing concern for most people on Earth. As the threat of obesity and metabolic disease looms in the 21st century, we must again be adaptive, and we must change our current economic systems and food processing technologies to improve our nutrition rather than to erode it. Thank you very much.